Good morning, church family. Would you join me in prayer? Almighty God, we come before you this morning. We are thankful that you have commanded us to approach your throne of grace boldly, not because we are worthy, but because of Jesus, our great high priest. And so we bring our request to you this morning. Father, we pray this morning for those who are here and in our church who are graduating from high school this month. Father, we especially think of those who have attended our, our youth group, those like David and Natalia, and Carson, Kevin, and Rachel. Lord, we're, we're thankful for each of these lives, and we pray on their behalf. Uh, for any of those that are working through questions in their faith, we pray that you would work in their lives. Father, give them a, a depth of genuine faith and trust in you. Father, for those who are graduating who are firmly trusting in Christ, we pray that you would preserve them and strengthen them in this new season that they are entering. Father, as they go into college, we pray that these students would grow first in their own love for Christ and that they would take every opportunity to speak of Christ and to disciple others. Lord, work in them, we pray, and through them. Father, we also this morning pray for mothers in our church. Father, we think of many mothers in various stages of life. We thank you for the faithfulness of, of many of the mothers that are sitting in this room and that are in our church. Lord, we pray today for mothers with young children in the home. We pray that you would give them patience and faithfulness as they care for their homes. Father, we, we pray for mothers with children who are out of the home. Uh, we, we pray for wisdom on how to love their children appropriately in this stage of life. May they be dedicated to prayer and marked by trust in you and your providence. Father, we pray for mothers who have lost children in our church. We pray that you would be near to their hearts as they grieve. Father, for those who grieve on Mother's Day because of children withheld, we pray that they would bring their tears to you, the God who Psalm 56 tells us puts our tears in a bottle, as it were. You see our pain and suffering. You care for us. Father, we pray this morning for our church that we would grow in Christ. Lord, we need to grow as a church. And we recognize that only you can work in us what we need. And so we ask that you would. We ask that you would mature us, that you would help us to reach out to those around us, Lord, that we would uh, share the good news of Christ boldly with others, even this week, Lord. Lord, make us a church that is eager and ready to reach out to our neighbors, we pray. Father, we pray not only for our church, but we pray for others like ours. We think of First Baptist Church of Delray. Father, even as, as certainly we have some differences between us uh, the, in ways that we are different, we're thankful that the most important things about us are the same, that we hold to the same gospel. And we love your word. We pray for Pastor Steve Thomas this morning as he preaches on Genesis 23. Father, we pray that you'd use his sermon in their church this morning. God, we pray the same for us. We pray for our church. May we grow because of Luke 19. Lord, it's a humbling thing to preach on repentance, knowing that my own life needs more repentance. Father, as we see this picture of your grace in Zacchaeus, we pray that it would be understood by more even this morning. We pray that we would understand our own regeneration better this morning. We pray that we would worship you this morning, O oh God. We pray that you'd meet with us even now. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. What does it look like 
to be made into a new person. If we want a picture of the transforming salvation that Jesus Christ brings, we might be helped this morning by starting with the story of John Newton. John Newton lived in the 1700s. He was the son of an irreligious and seafaring father, and he himself became a sailor. He lived a selfless, a selfish and godless life. As an English sailor, uh, Newton eventually became the captain of a transatlantic slave ship. He made a business, he made a livelihood in the evil of chattel slavery, abducting and stealing men, women, and children, and selling them for his own profit and gain. In his memoirs, Newton wrote, I was capable of anything. I had not the least fear of God before my eyes, nor, so far as I remember, the least sensibility of conscience. Then, on March 21st, 1748, God sent a storm to the ship that Newton was uh, captaining. Captaining? Is that a word? Driving? What, whatever you do with ships. Thank you. Uh, this storm awoke Newton to his spiritual condition. It got his attention. He uh, had been taught the gospel as a child by his mother. How fitting for Mother's Day. And that day, he thought back to what his mother had taught him as a young child. And he cried out to God in the middle of the sea, in the middle of that storm. He marks that day as the day of his conversion, when he turned from sin to God. In the years following, Newton would leave the slave trade. He would grow in his faith. He would eventually become a pastor. And as his remorse over his previous life grew, he became an influential supporter of William Wilberforce, the British abolitionist who led the fight to end slavery in England. Now, Newton's life is an example of one that was completely turned around by coming to faith in Christ. He didn't just become a better person. He didn't just become a more uh, sincere person. He didn't just become a, a more religious person. John Newton became a radically new person as he turned to faith in Christ. He was no longer the same man. Friends, this transformation that comes by faith in the gospel at the moment that we believe in Christ and he begins a new work in us, this transformation is what we might call, what Acts calls, conversion. Now, I realize that even as I say that word, that's a loaded word in today's culture. For many in the world around us, the word conversion alludes to almost a forcible manipulation to adopt something someone doesn't believe. And if the word conversion holds that connotation for you, I'm so sorry. Christianity, according to the Bible, has never been a message of outward manipulation. It's been exactly the opposite. It's been a message of inward renewal. And so when the Bible uses this word conversion, it's speaking biblically of a good thing, of a, of a complete and joyful transformation that happens inside of us when we look in faith to Jesus Christ as our Lord, and when he becomes our Savior. And today, as we've been studying through, chapter by chapter, the book of Luke, this biography of Jesus Christ, we see a helpful picture of what this transformation looks like. If you've brought your Bibles, open them this morning to Luke chapter 19. Here in Luke 19, we find the story of Zacchaeus, the wee little man, which, though familiar 
for, for many of us from childhood songs and Sunday schools, is actually quite a surprising story as we see what's really going on and what I think Luke is trying to get our attention to see with the transformation of this man. I'd like to suggest to you that this morning that Luke writes this story to highlight a portrait of the transformation that Jesus Christ brings. He gives us this picture of conversion. In fact, we see the shape of the story by the way the story ends. Look down with me at verse 10. We just read this, but we read there a summary. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This passage is showing us a lost man that was sought and saved. We're going to see how this happens. We'll, we'll learn today that conversion, that is receiving new life in Jesus Christ, includes at least four things. It includes more than this, certainly, we see in the New Testament, but at least in this passage, I want to just emphasize four aspects of what this transformation in Jesus Christ brings. It includes hearing a new call, receiving a new joy, embracing a new repentance, and joining a new people. That's where I'm going today. As I, I pray, as we look at this story today, some of you, maybe some of you here today, will come to trust in Jesus Christ for the first time in your life. Maybe some of you here today, who have already experienced this transformation I'm talking about, will have a newfound joy as you rejoice in what God has done in you, and you understand it better. Pray that God works as we look at this text together. Look at, with me at verse 1 of our passage. Luke begins the story telling us that he, Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. This was the city, you'll remember, from the last chapter where Jesus had met blind Bartimaeus sitting there outside of the city gates. Uh, Jericho would have been a major city and a, uh, on a major trade route to Jerusalem. A, a good deal of commerce would have come through this city. And so it's natural that we're introduced to this character in Jericho in verse 2. Look at verse 2. And behold, there was a na man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. Now, we've seen tax collectors in Luke already. Typically, they aren't great guys. As I've already emphasized, this role is not merely a, a city official or an accountant, so don't think just IRS worker when you see this. Think this would be a, a position that was held by a Jew who was enlisted by the, the Roman occupiers to extort other Jews for money. So Rome was eager to, to tax the nation of Israel and would give the tax collectors free license and support to extort their own people. And as long as Rome received their, her fair share of the spoil, these men could, could go to town and, and reap massive benefits. So inevitably, this was a corrupt position. It was used really as one of betrayal to one's own neighbors to prosper over their misfortune. It's one of the reasons why I began uh, with the story of a, of a slave trader. This would have just been a disgusting position. It, it would have been offensive. It would have been viewed with revulsion in the eyes of those in Jericho. And Jericho was a larger city, so it likely would have had a, a team of such men as this Zacchaeus here. So we find here this term in verse 2 that we really see nowhere else in Scripture of a chief tax collector. Likely, Zacchaeus was the coordinator of this whole operation of other tax collectors. So you can think of the guy that holds the plush job, uh, the, the boss who receives the cut of everyone under him, the big kin, kingpin or sheriff of Nottingham. Unliked, despised, corrupt, and rich. That's this man. And, and to round off this character, Luke tells us that he was also short and curious. So, he, he wanted to see Jesus for himself. He, he wanted to see who Jesus was in verse 3. And so in verse 4 we read, he ran on ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, Jesus, for he was about to pass that way. Now, 
this might have been unusual for a man of his status to, to be out climbing a tree, but a, a sycamore tree would have been a natural choice. It had close branches, so it would have been easy to climb up. Uh, you'd be able to have a, some natural height to see over the heads of the crowds that were surrounding Jesus. There's, there's all different interpretations for what's really going on here. Here's what I think. I think we're seeing a man who doesn't run up to Jesus and, and beg from him. Uh, a man who doesn't push through the crowd like the, the, the woman we've seen that needs help to just touch the edge of his garments. We're not seeing a desperate man like the men who went up on the roof and, and tore apart the roof so that they could just lower their friend through to get to Jesus. No, we see a man who's, who's curious to see Jesus and who figures out a way to do it from a distance. He look, figures out how to, how to look on in curiosity. He's perched away up in the tree. He clearly had just no intention of meeting this rabbi. I mean, clearly he had no intention of following this rabbi. He is off up in the tree trying to just get a, a glimpse of Jesus as he passes by. I wonder if anyone here is, is happy to observe Jesus from a distance. Maybe you can relate to this curiosity without eagerness to really approach Jesus. Well, from this vantage point, Zacchaeus can get a sight of Jesus without having to fight his way through this crowd that surely hated him. Friends, there are no safe distances when Jesus is involved. Here's the surprise of the text, as Joel Green puts it. Hoping to see Jesus, Zacchaeus is seen by Jesus. Look at verse 5 with me. We'll camp out there. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. All right, point number one. Here we see new life in Christ includes, firstly, hearing a new call. Now, let me carefully show that the emphasis of this story is not on Zacchaeus' moral pursuit of Christ. That's not what we're seeing here. It's not on his desperation to come ask of Christ for his help. It's not on his insight into Christ's identity. The emphasis of the story is not on how Zacchaeus was a man that was good enough, or moral enough, or spiritual enough, or nice enough, or cleaned up enough to be a follower of Christ. I mean, Zacchaeus is at best a curious and distant observer to the person of Jesus Christ. And so the emphasis of the story is not that Zacchaeus is changed because he went after Jesus, but because Jesus went after him. Look at this effectual call here in verse 5. It's glorious. First, Jesus doesn't continue down the crowded road with the parade of people working their way forward. No, he stops. And Luke observes, he, he looks up, away from the crowd, away from what's going on. He looks up into the tree. And then next, notice Zacchaeus doesn't call out for Jesus. No, Jesus calls out to Zacchaeus. And then third, did you notice how Jesus calls to Zacchaeus? He calls Zacchaeus by name. Now, how did Jesus know Zacchaeus' name? They had never met before. They had no previous history. They, they, they didn't have any rapport already established. This, I think, fits straightly in the, the category of Jesus knowing that there would be a coin in the fish, or Jesus knowing to put down his, the nets on the other side of the boat. This is a knowledge of the one who had existed before all time, the one who had, I would argue, chosen Zacchaeus before the foundation of the world. John 10 says that the sheep hear his voice when he calls, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. So Jesus here is calling Zacchaeus, and he calls him by name, and he commands an immediate following. Hurry and come down. This call by Jesus must be obeyed, for I, I must stay at your house today. I love this word, must. You could translate this, it is necessary that I stay at your house today. 
And I love that word today. This can't wait. I've got to come today. When Christ calls, he begins his transformation immediately. This call was a call to a new relationship. You see, in his day, uh, to stay in a home, to, to dine and to dwell, was to extend an offer of relationship. It was to offer friendship. And this is exactly what Jesus is initiating. As Tim Keller wrote, ultimately it was not Zacchaeus who asked Jesus into his life, but it was, at, it was Jesus who asked Zacchaeus into his. Friends, do you know how this is, do you know that this is how it always works with Jesus? Charles Spurgeon preached uh, an entire sermon just on this one verse. Uh, he wrote it on the effectual call of Christ. How, how when Christ calls, his call must be obeyed. You see, when we as people invite others to believe in Jesus, our invitation is always an offer. Many people will refuse it. But when Jesus works in a sinner's heart, when he gives out his call to us, his call is always effectual. It always accomplishes what it sets out to do. It awakens those who are asleep. It, it gives life to the dead. This is how Jesus' call works. So if you're here today and you're a Christian, you should be praising God right now. Because you look at your own life and you say, this is true of me. I, I never would have responded to Christ had his call not worked in my heart to awaken me from the dead. Your heart should be praising him for the same thing that happened for Zacchaeus. The call that said, you must come. I must stay. It is necessary. I will stay and dwell with you today. You say, that was true of me as well. Praise God. If you're praying for a lost friend, church, or perhaps you're sharing the gospel with someone who doesn't know Christ, I think you should find a sense of peace in this truth. Because you know that all your friend needs, all your family member ever needs, is just for God to call their name. And it's over. Let's move on. This story, we not only learn that conversion includes hearing a new call, but it also includes, secondly, receiving a new joy. Here, I want to camp out on verse 6. Look there with me. We read, So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Now, important to note here is that Luke mirrors his words between verses 5 and verse 6. So in verse 5, Jesus says, hurry, and in verse 6, he hurried. In verse 5, Jesus said, come down, and in verse 6, he came down. In verse 5, Jesus said, I must stay at your house, and in verse 6, it says, so he received him. It's at this moment that obedience is emphasized, and at that moment, what kind of duty is present in this obedience? Was this a mere obligation for Zacchaeus? Maybe you're here today and you're considering Christ. And you think, if I did everything the Bible says to do, it would just be a drudgery for me. It would be a, a duty-filled obligation if I really obeyed what Jesus commands. But notice at the, the very moment that Luke here mirrors Jesus' command with Zacchaeus' obedience. It's there that he tells us that Zacchaeus received him joyfully. What a great summary of salvation, isn't it? Receiving Jesus joyfully. This obedience was a joyful one for Zacchaeus. Friends, when Christ calls, obedience and joy are not two separate destinations. It's not like we get to a fork in the road, and we have to choose go down this road, and you get to obey. You go down this road, and you'll get joy. No, with Christ, receiving Jesus means receiving joy. If you don't believe this, you're believing a lie. This is actually a theme of Luke that uh, if we're following along with some of the key words that Luke uses throughout this biography, it is repeatedly emphasized by the doctor as he tells the story. So Luke 1, the angel announces to uh, Jesus, to, or sorry, announces a birth to Elizabeth, and, he, and the angel announces it with joy. 
Luke 2, the angel announces to Mary that there will be great joy for all people. Luke 10, the disciples are told to rejoice when their names are written in the book. Luke 13, the people have joy at the glorious things that Jesus has done. Luke 15, it's fitting for the house to celebrate with joy when the prodigal son returns home. Luke 19, here, Zacchaeus receives Jesus with joy. Later in Luke 19, the whole multitude of disciples will erupt with joy as the Messiah comes into Jerusalem. The whole book is a joy parade. And there at the front of it is Jesus leading the joy parade. So do you want to know about the conversion, the change that, that Jesus Christ brings? Coming to Jesus means receiving a, a whole new joy. It, it means trading out the cheap, short-lived, earthly, counterfeit joys that this world offers. And, and receiving a new, pervading, eternal, never-ending, ever-deepening, Jesus-centered joy. Let me just give one application here. Christian friends, do you know how this could transform your evangelism if you believe this to be true? Oh, how I want us to be a church that grows in evangelism. Do you know how easy it is and how easy it becomes to tell people about Jesus when you're truly convinced that Jesus is the most joyful thing that could ever happen to them? You know, happy people aren't shy about what they're happy about. When, when something really brings you incredible joy, you share it. You tell others about it. You post it on Instagram. It's contagious. Oh, that we would really believe. Oh, that we would really experience the joy that receiving Christ brings. I think we would share Christ more if we did. Apart from him is an absence of joy. Look at verse 7 briefly with me. We read there that when they saw it, they all grumbled. He's gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. So it seems in the eyes of the onlookers that this tax collector, this corrupt and, and evil man, didn't deserve this rabbi to come into his home. Maybe, maybe Jesus just didn't understand how, how sinful Zacchaeus was. Maybe Jesus just didn't understand how, how staying in, Jesus's, in Zacchaeus' home would be basically condoning his sin. And so they grumble. Oh, church, is there anyone in your mind that is beyond the reach of Jesus? Is there anyone in your mind that is less deserving of Jesus than you are? That if Jesus saved that person, really? I mean, yes, free grace. But really? Oh, may the Lord protect us from such judgmentalism. The, the, the picture here is that joy and judgmentalism don't go together. You can have one or the other. The happiest character is the sinner that knows he's a sinner and receives Jesus. The grumbling characters are the ones who think they're not sinners and they actually don't get to receive Jesus. Who would you rather be? We should move on. A, a third attribute of true conversion that I think this story illustrates for us is number three, conversion includes embracing a new repentance. Oh, here is, is such a center thrust of this story of Zacchaeus. It, what we see here is really a, a radical level of repentance from this man. The scene here in the story, uh, by the way, just seems to shift. So in, in verse 6 and 7, it seems that Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house. And, and so then it seems perhaps that per, verse 8 might have taken place in Zacchaeus' house. Uh, perhaps imagine them sitting around a dinner table with a lot of food and, and guests kind of standing there looking on as this rich man has this rabbi into his home. We get to verse 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. 
And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. This is staggering. This is clear. It's public, radical repentance. The, the, this, these words standing up signifies that this is some type of public acknowledgement. Calling Jesus Lord shows that he knows who his new master is. Now, in the Mosaic law, there would have been an expectation to give 10%. Did you notice Zacchaeus here gives 50%? And then there's this fourfold restoration to anyone who he has unjustly defrauded. Back in ex Exodus 22, verse 1, when stealing a sheep, it was required that you pay back the sheep fourfold. Perhaps Zacchaeus is thinking back to that, and he wants to make sure that he pays back fully as he ought, not just for a sheep, but for anything at all he's defrauded. I think, th I think the emphasis here on the finances is just to point out that the, the center, the chief, the greatest idol for Zacchaeus that was consuming him as someone apart from God, not fearing God, that greatest idol was the one that he first tore down. And he, he most radically said, I will tear it everything down so that I can have this new Lord and this new master. And so when we, too, experience new life in Christ, repentance might not be perfect, oh, friends, but it is evident, and it is practical, and it is decisive, and it is, when needed to be, public. When possible, it includes taking steps to make right the wrongs that we have done. I think that's what we see here. No one could have looked at Zacchaeus' life and wondered if he was actually remorseful, if he was going to change the, what he was doing with this occupation of being a chief tax collector. He made it just abundantly obvious. I've got a new Lord. There's a visible, outward change that accompanied this new relationship that he had with Christ. Friends, this was true for Zacchaeus, and it is true for us today. Listen to what J.C. Ryle says about this passage. He says, Faith that does not purify the heart and life is not faith at all. Grace that cannot be seen like light and tasted like salt is not grace, but hypocrisy. The man who professes to know Christ and trust him while he cleaves to sin and the world is going down to hell with a lie in his right hand. The heart that has really tasted the grace of Christ will instinctively hate sin. Church, do you hate sin? Have you turned from sin radically? Are you, are you still turning from sin? It, it, do you make it your life's business to turn more and more to Jesus and away and away from sin? I don't I think it's any coincidence that the first of Martin Luther's 95 theses uh, that he posted on the wall on the door of Wittenberg was all of the Christian life is one of repentance. Friends, this is what we as Christians are to be about, is continually turning from our sin. Friends, this is, this is the start of a new life in Christ, is to make a decisive break with our past of sin. This is the evidence of a new life. So we come to the end of the passage. And Jesus summarizes what's happened. Look down at verses 9 and 10. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Salvation had indeed come to the house. Jesus had come to that house that day. But notice that the salvation was declared as evident after the repentance had been seen. So when Jesus sees this repentance, that's when he says, I, I've got evidence now. The transformation has happened. You're turning. You're making it visible. We know it's real when we see the repentance. Put together, this story just gives this beautiful progression of how God works. God calls with an effectual call. We receive Christ, which means uh, receiving joy. Christ brings the greatest of all joy which then results in repentance, which is the evidence of this salvation that we receive. Friends, 
The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. The lost like you and I. But there's one more point I want to emphasize uh, through this passage. One final aspect of our conversion that's the inevitable result for those who will be saved. To be saved. Uh, number four, conversion includes, fourthly, joining a new people. I wonder if you noticed this strange declaration of Christ in verse 9. Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. Fair enough. I'm with you. Uh, since he also is a son of Abraham. Now, when, when I found that, that verse this week, I was floored. Well, n- not quite. I, I was confused first, and then I was floored. So if you're still in the confused stage, that's fine. Stick with me here. Why does Jesus say this? Why does Jesus point to Zacchaeus as being a son of Abraham as part of the reasoning that salvation had come? Let me come at it this way. Uh, Zacchaeus had been acting in a role not only as a corrupt and selfish man, but as a tax collector. He was a traitor to his own people. He was under the employ of the occupying force of Rome, and he was working to abuse the Jews, to abuse the people of God. So to be in this role, well, he had to be a Jew by birth, sure, but honestly, just barely. Imagine just how outsider this man of an outsider this man was. If you just want to illustrate this, you could uh, read in another gospel in Matthew 18 when Jesus teaches the church how to treat church members who were no longer claiming the name of Christ but were now disciplined under church discipline and shown to be unbelievers. Jesus says to the church to treat them as what? as a Gentile and as a tax collector, as an outsider, as not one who's living like the insiders live. That's Zacchaeus. He is the, is the chief tax collector. He is the outsider. He's the traitor to his people, people such that he might as well not be considered part of God's chosen people. And then if you were to read on in the New Testament, we would find that when Paul wants to teach the church that's forming, he teaches us to think about ourselves that are in this community of faith as those that are the new, adopted, spiritual sons of Abraham. That's who we are. I think Jesus is tapping into that biblical theme. This is what I think he's saying. I think Jesus is saying, do you see, do you see Zacchaeus over here? Do you want to know who's truly part of the people of God? who are truly the spiritual sons of Abraham, it's people like him. It's those that have been called by me and received me with joy and evidenced it in repentance. This, this is the new nation that I'm making. This is the new people that I'm setting apart. People that have come to me and been changed. Friends, this is what conversion does. This is what the transformation of Christ does. It doesn't just create a whole new person. It creates a whole new people of God. Michael Lawrence writes such a helpful little book, uh, Conversion, How God Creates a People. Listen to what he says on this very point. He says, the doctrine of new life in Christ doesn't just impact how we understand an individual's conversion. It has a corporate dimension, too. A local church should be a community of new creatures. Through our love and obedience, we give powerful testimony to the radical truth of the gospel. You know, the the world can write off a single Christian as an aberration. Put two or three Christians together, and it's harder to write them off. Put five or ten or fifty or a hundred Christians living together in gracious, loving community, and you have a message that cannot be ignored. Friends, this is what we're trying to see here at First Baptist 
This is what we're trying to see created. We want to see a people that have been pulled together who are true sons of Abraham by faith, who are marked off from the world around us as having truly experienced the new life by faith in the gospel, who have received Christ and are becoming more and more distinct from the world around us by our lives of, of holiness and grace, who believe that, that we're not going to be winning the world around us by being like the world around us, but rather that we will win the world by being distinct as we reject our sin and walk away from it. That's how we can see who it is that, that are the true spiritual sons and daughters of Abraham. And so this is just one reason why here at our church we emphasize meaningful membership here. We encourage people to take seriously the call to membership, the call to being a known part of a local church. This is one reason we have uh, membership interviews for, for those who are joining our church. Not to really determine if someone is good enough to get in. No, but to, to look for signs of credible faith and credible repentance. That's what we want to see. Uh, this is also one reason why we as a church uh, have historically kept baptism and church membership and the Lord's Supper all together, uh, connected as, as one package. We understand that, that Scripture sees these three things, membership in a church, baptism into a church, the Lord's Supper as a church, that Scripture sees these as being part of the new covenant for those who are in the new covenant community of the local church, the new covenant people that are called out as a church. We just want to honor that biblical principle that we see so clearly. Friends, in all of this, the witness that our world needs around us is a compelling community of believers who, like Zacchaeus, aren't just nicer people and aren't just better people, but are new people that are radically changed from the inside out. You know, if you want to read more about this important concept of how God transforms us through the new book, this book through the new birth. This book, Conversion, is an excellent and short read. It's easy to read. In fact, we believe it's so helpful that at the end of the service today, the elders are going to be out in the hallways, and we're going to be giving out free copies of this book to anyone who wants them. We should have enough uh, for one for each adult if the married couples share them. Uh, the goal is that, that you could read and better clarify your own thinking about how God creates a new people for himself. You could do this by just taking the book and just reading a, a chapter a week by yourself this summer. That would be a great reading project. You could make it even better, and you could find somebody else in our church and read it with them. Just read two or three chapters every couple weeks, get together, talk about those two or three chapters, and, and see what you both are learning together as you read about how God is setting apart a new people for himself. Friends, we want to think well about what God is doing in the, this work of conversion. If you're new here today, and everything I'm talking about is, is brand new for you, let me encourage you, don't leave here without talking to someone about how God makes us new in Christ. There's nothing more important that you could think about than, than this message of being transformed. Sinners who have rebelled against God, but, but those who God has sent his son Jesus to, to, to save, to take our punishment on, on our behalf. Friends, if you're not sure that you have embraced this message, talk to someone today before leaving. We should conclude. You know, that slave trader that I began with, John Newton, was not only converted to faith in Christ, uh, he was radically changed. And then he was galvanized to give his life to the local church. He went on to be just a, a phenomenal pastor. Uh, he wrote a profound series of letters to his congregation on the new life that is ours in Christ. And, and John Newton also became a hymn writer. In 1772, he penned a hymn for the New Year's Day service. 
and he reflected on his own miraculous conversion. He originally titled the hymn, Faith's Review and Expectation. Let me close this morning with reading the first two verses of this hymn. It reads, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the work of Jesus Christ. We thank you for him coming to seek and to save the lost. Father, we pray that we would understand what this means better. We pray that we would be those that receive Christ with joy, that we would be those that turn from our sins and radically repent, that we would want nothing to do with our sin but to leave it behind. Lord, I pray for those in this room that are thinking through these ideas. I pray that you would give clarity according to your word. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand, church.